CCC volunteers deliver aid supplies to affected residents after torrential rains in Shohobaru. Filipino CCC volunteers go into damaged villages and plan to rebuild local religious centers. Welcome to our headlines on Megas High. Thank you for joining us. In Shohobaru, Malaysia, floods happened after consecutive rain days. City volunteers went there to care and also send disaster relief materials, making sure the residents felt warm and comfortable. The torrential rains in Jalan Padar, Malaysia, caused severe flooding. The home of an affected resident, Marceline, was flooded, and many of the furniture were badly damaged. Fortunately, Chichi volunteers rushed to the disaster area to distribute emergency aids and care to her, touching her heart. The water was so deep, it felt like everything was in the ocean. All the things were badly waterlogged. I'm really sad. According to local residents' speculation, the severe flood was triggered by the construction of the high-rise buildings located beside the river. The flood here was not attracted to the river, but the surrounding construction sites. They didn't make the drainage channels correctly, so that excess water could not be drained to the river but flow back here. Volunteers visited the affected family and saw everywhere was a mess. The volunteers are more grateful for the peace they have in their lives. Just like the master said, the most important thing is to cultivate a gentle mind. The society as well as the earth will then be more peaceful as they are all linked together. So we need to cultivate our hearts and do recycling together. My heart goes to you when I knew that severe flooding arisen from heavy rain hit Ulu Pulai village, I was very sad. Chiji volunteers gave distribution aids to Maslina respectfully, making her feel warm and comforted. I'm very grateful to you. We dare not expect to have anything. Yet you send us the emergency aids relieving some of our burden. I'm really grateful for your help. Thank you very much. Although the affected residents still worry about flooding, under the care and encouragement of Chiji volunteers, the affected residents put down their worries temporarily and pray together the flood would not come back again. And it's nearing the performance day of the Sutra adaptation in Malaysia. Sitchings and community volunteers spend the weekend assembling the stage at the Jinsi Ho in Kuala Lumpur. Let's take a look. From moving to assembling, this group of youth are helping as best as they can. <laughs> As it is nearing the Sutra adaptation performance in Malaysia, cities of Kuala Lumpur and Selangor are constructing the stage at the Kuala Lumpur Jingsi Hall. The planning committee came to look at the venue and went over the measurements we need for the stage and the Sutra performance. So we have begun assembling according to those needs. As it's the first time for many of the Tsichings to perform such a task, they look to the more experienced volunteers for assistance. We must pay more attention to details. If we all just focus our efforts a bit more each time, mistakes can be reduced and the task can be completed faster. I do not have as much strength as the boys, so I do like to tax move light items or help wherever I can. As it is very important to assemble the stage correctly, the check for its sturdiness is done with much care. We're checking to see where it could be unstable and we'll add an extra metal or wood support by tying it together. The stage is to support Dharma teaching, so it must be sturdy and solid for the volunteer performers to stand on. With such careful assembly by the over 21 member team, the onstage volunteers will sure shine brightly on the day of the performance. It's been seven months after Cyclone, it died, but Siji volunteers from Mozambique continue to pour their love into the disaster zone of Namantanda to conduct Jinsi Avarism teachings at the schools. We're teaching them how to line up because with so many of them here, it can easily turn into a crazy mob. We hope they can behave and be well-mannered children. This 
after lesson is teaching the children about these aphorisms. While getting enough to eat is a problem in this country, going to school to get an education isn't. It's a matter of other obstacles in the way. The volunteers put on a comedic skit the children can relate to, all in hopes of teaching them that education is really the way out of poverty. I didn't have time to go to school, but what I learned in school, you see, Mama, I can't escribe my name, 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 Eu estava a ficar atrasada, pá. Juro, mamã. Você vai ser doutora mesmo? Sim, quero ser doutora, mamã. There are so many students here today because the children have hope that after the lessons, Siji will give them some food. However, today there is only one biscuit per child, which is an opportunity for a humanitarian lesson. We explain to the principal why we're only giving them one biscuit per person. We don't want them to be greedy and expecting food each time they come to our lessons. As today, the point is not in receiving eight items, but in the Jinsi efforts and teachings. We hope to bring gratefulness, respect, and love into the school. This 11-year-old did not eat the biscuit given to him, but instead is holding on to it tightly. He has two brothers and he wanted to take the biscuit home to share with them. Siji volunteers held an award ceremony in Wuhan, China, by not just providing them financial support, but giving them love and care through regular meetings every semester. Let's meet some scholarship recipients. Early morning in the kitchen of the liaison office, Siji volunteers were busy preparing delicious vegan dishes for welcoming the scholarship students. Most of the scholarship students are from Huazhong University of Science and Technology. They have regular meetings with volunteers and became more and more mature every time they meet. I'm a medical student. What we learn not only saves lives, but also spreading love and care to the patients, just like what volunteers taught us. Every week, I make video call with my parents, sharing my daily life with them. Whenever I have breaks, I go home to help my parents with some housework. Volunteers treat the scholarship recipients as their own child. They make sure that they don't have to worry about their basic needs during their studies and accompany them in life. Dignity and selfless love is our human instinct that will never change. The volunteer wish the scholarship recipients learn to be grateful and reciprocate the love they have received to others in the future. Yang Renmin, the recipient of Tainan's New Shoes Scholarship, is a student in the musical department of National Tsinghua University. She was raised by her adopted father alone, but the harsh life didn't stop her from showing her talent in music. Here's the story. Yang Renmin, who studies in the musical department of National Tsinghua University, has excellent talent in violin. However, she didn't pay a lot of tuition to learn to play violin, but was taught for free. I began to learn play violin when I was in elementary school band, but I've always had teacher who helped me, so I did not pay any tuition. I always had a dream to become a teacher so I can help the next generation. Her teachers helped her because she was raised by her adopted father who had a stroke since she was a young age. Their life only got worse when he was paralyzed due to another stroke. Dad, please rest. I'm going. When my dad was paralyzed, I screamed and cried when riding the scooter whenever I went to visit him. She's afraid that her father would worry about her if she's always for too long. So she asked me to go see her father for her. 
Tsu Ji volunteers help has calmed her heart a bit. To take care of her ill father, she saved up to buy nutritious food for him. Her father is very proud of her because she's smart and filial. When I received the Mayor Arts Award, my father attended the ceremony. He was very happy. Don't worry about me. I have many people by my side. Please rest in peace. Her father has left the world, but his love will always remain in her heart. The Juventus found that almost all of the religious centers in every village on Mindano Island have collapsed. Volunteers documented the needs of each community church and hoped to rebuild them for affected residents. The majority of Filipinos are Catholic, hence religious belief is one of the most important things in their life. However, the earthquake has destroyed the castle of their religion. Where I am now is the parishal village of Tununan town. On my left side is the green building, which is their health center. The yellow building is their village office and the daycare center right next to it. There have been a series of massive earthquakes here since mid-October. The church collapsed when the third earthquake occurred. The volunteers assessed damage in the disaster area on Mindano Island. Volunteers have found that not only local residents' houses have been ruined, but their religious center has also collapsed. It collapsed completely. There's no pillar, so the entire church collapsed. These cement buildings fall easily. In Mongnok, the church can stand two massive earthquakes and have been ruined. Fortunately, local residents moved out of chairs for prayer before the church collapsed. At first, she saw there were cracks in the church wall. They moved these out immediately. Then the church collapsed during the second earthquake. Although it's a temporary church, it's still a holy ground to come for local residents. Especially during the time of disaster, affected residents owe hope to rebuild the church so they can get through this hard time. We are very sad that the church collapsed because it's the shelter of our heart. We hope to rebuild this church. Volunteers also accompany these girls to pray, hoping that their wishes can be granted and find peace in their hearts soon. Filipino city volunteers continue to enter heavily damaged villages in Tulunan town. Volunteers went to schools to assess the situations in hopes that children's education wouldn't be interrupted for too long. Volunteers travel by car to the most damaged areas in Tulunan town. They arrive at the first destination, New Caridad, by noon. There was a physically challenged senior living there. Fortunately, we saved him before the house collapsed. Volunteers assessed local schools with government staff guiding the way. Residents in this village lived in the mountain, and many don't dare to sleep in their houses again. We do not have an ev evacuation center. We put up tents outside the house so that when earthquake happens, especially nighttime, you are safe. 46-year-old Dina takes care of eight children alone since her husband is working in another location. After a few massive earthquakes, the whole family moved outside to sleep under the tent. We are scared to stay inside my house because it, maybe the earthquake came, it will break again. Not just the affected residents, even CG volunteers are worried about the aftershocks when assessing damages. Oh. Oh, it's the aftershocks continue to take place in the disaster area. Therefore, many residents rather stay in tents rather than returning home. Many of their houses were all that they've got, and now it has all become ruins. It took eight months to build this house and it was about to be finished. I can't believe it collapsed during the third creek. According to the Tulunan town government data, there were six heavily damaged villages in this earthquake. Volunteers took two days to visit them all and collect affected families' data. They plan to return and distribute aid supplies as soon as possible. 
There is a small village in Japan that is quite famous for its beautiful environment and a recycling project that includes as many as 48 items. The whole village promotes the concept of zero waste, as everyone must pursue a very rigorous recycling initiative. Let's travel to this historical village. It is a four-hour drive from Osaka to get to this village, which many think is quite unbelievable. Couple surnamed Katayama are true kamakatsu persons. This can be incinerated. This is a recyclable bottle cap, a PET bottle, and aluminum can. There are more than 20 trash cans and garbage bags in this home. They are placed around the living room and the kitchen. There are even more on the second floor as this village has the most extensive garbage classification in Japan. Every household in the village has a government-supplied kitchen waste disposal machine. The small ones are in the households and the large ones are on the farm. The village offices will fully subsidize the cost, as kitchen waste can be disposed of by the villagers. At present, the whole village wants to achieve zero kitchen waste. Cooked kitchen waste will be used by villagers to grow vegetables. What comes from the land, they hope to return to the land in a virtuous life cycle. I used to be an office worker and now I'm retired and live on a pension. So if you want to give back to nature, one can arrange your own schedule, which is my most ideal type of life. Mr. Katayama, who is actually a retired town council member, is a self-sufficient farmer in his hometown. He is following his own personal plan to live the rest of his life. In Kamakatsu, Tokushima Prefecture, a zero waste program has been in operation since 2003. From the beginning, the waste was divided into 12 different types, which has now advanced to the current 48 different types. The village office also issues a booklet to explain in detail how garbage is to be sorted. The small village has about 1,500 people and there's no garbage disposal plant. Because of the careful classification, villagers have reduced the amount of garbage they generate. About 27 years ago, staff and others held a seminar to discuss how to improve our town. Kamikatsu is located in the upper reaches of the Kumanogawa River. We thought about how to avoid degrading the environment, so it was very important for everyone to reach a consensus and protect our environment. This is why we started this project. <laughs> Opening the cell phone and looking at today's order is the work of this 82-year-old mother-in-law today. <laughs> Eliminating almost all of the pollution in this town helps protect the forest, as there are hundreds of edible leaves in this mountain forest. This is Kamikatsu's Farmer Association. The leaves and flowers collected will be sent here. The shipment of jasmine was just picked this morning.
High-end Japanese cuisine requires a lot of flowers and leaves for each plate, and now 80% of them come from this area in Japan. Many elders in the village usually do this work to subsidize their pension. The overall operating income of this leaf business is about 2.4 million US dollars. There are 152 farmhouses in Kamikatsu who are registered to participate in the leaf business. That is to say, 152 households have a total income of 2.4 million US dollars. The bubbling brook accompanies an ancient water wheel and the terraces in the mountains, which is much like how the scenery was a hundred years ago. The terraces and forests of Kamakatsu make it one of the most beautiful villages in Japan. Villagers talk of rumors that the gods endowed the mountains with resources, as they were asked to take only what they need, not to be greedy. Because of this, the forest has supported the villagers economically, has also added to the beauty of their homeland. The series Great Dharma Masters in History by Dai TV is shooting the story of Master Yulin. It has been produced by Sun Tui Film Art Workshop. They even invited Yang Qing Huang, who played the same role in 1992, to join the shooting. <laughs> Master Yulin, the state master of Emperor Sunzi in the early period of the Qin Dynasty, is renowned for his eloquence and wisdom. Dai TV is now preparing the story of Master Yulin, with the production team even inviting actor Yang Qinghuang, who played the same role 27 years ago, to join them. We remember that it was Yang Qinghuang who was the first person playing Master Yuling very well. So this time we had an idea to invite Mr. Yang to join our shooting of Master Yuling. The story of Master Yu Lin had been done in Taiwanese opera, stage plays, and even TV drama. I'm an actor, so I have many things to simulate. But what goes through the mind of a Dharma master cannot be simulated. This is Yang Qinghuang's first debut in the Taiwanese opera, but he does not play the role of Master Yulin, but dictator Dogon, the regent of the early Qing dynasty. <laughs> I have to speak Taiwanese in this drama. And I was learning how to say Dorgan in Taiwanese. Do you know how? It sounds like rolling over. I just learned it today. I want to thank everyone for giving me this chance. I was saying that he's still as sharp as ever. His voice and his lung capacity still have a lot of power. So I hope that when Master Yuling is broadcasted, everyone should watch it. This exchange between two generations will give people much to talk about even before Master Yuling is aired. The five days is overseas commissioner training camp is in Ban Chao Jing Si Hao. Take a look and see you next time.